One day after pagers used by hundreds of members of the Hezbollah terror group exploded, even more electronic devices detonated in Lebanon on Wednesday. Now, it all began Tuesday when the pagers exploded almost simultaneously in Lebanon and Syria, killing at least 12 people and wounding about 3,000 others. Israel did not claim responsibility for the attack, but American officials reportedly stated that Israel did brief the U.S. on that operation. More blasts were heard Wednesday and appeared to be an explosion of walkie-talkies and solar panels used by the terror group. In that attack, at least 20 people died and 450 were hurt. That is according to Lebanese health officials. I do want to talk about all of this here, so let's bring in a friend of the show, David Dowd, Senior Fellow at the Foundation for Defense of Democracies. Thank you so much for taking the time, as always, to be here with us and help break it down. Thank you so much for having me on, Josh. All right, so first off, the big question here, we're talking about pagers, we're talking walkie-talkies. Who exactly would have access to these? Are we just talking about Hezbollah terror operatives, or are we talking about civilians as well? Um, well, it's an excellent question. This was a pinpoint strike uh, in the manner of speaking against Hezbollah operatives. These uh, communications devices, be they the walkie-talkies, or the, uh, the pagers were used exclusively, the ones that detonated at least, were used exclusively by Hezbollah members. These, this was a precautionary measure that Hezbollah had undertaken after uh, fear that Israeli, the Israelis were spying in on their communications networks. If you go back a few months, uh, Secretary General Hassan Nasrallah had warned the group's followers um, and the group's members to be wary of their cell phones, to be wary of Wi-Fi connections, of CCTV, Anything he said that the Israelis, the Israeli enemy, in his, in his words, could use to, uh, to, to, to connect to, to spy on uh, the goings and comings in different areas of Lebanon, uh, particularly those controlled by Hezbollah. Uh, about a month or so back, uh, I think it was a report in Reuters that uh, had said that Hezbollah had switched to this uh, low technology method, um, beepers um, and other uh, kind of low technology methods to avoid Israeli surveillance. I think they didn't expect that the Israelis would kind of do an end run around that and uh, not try to uh, spy in on them, but uh, detonate the devices. Uh, as for the walkie-talkies, similarly, these were uh, used by Hezbollah members either at the funerals of um, the people who had died the day prior um, or uh, who were in their homes. You know, Hezbollah members aren't exactly uh, in, in, in hanging out in barracks. Uh, they don't have identifiable uh, military buildings uh, in which they spend their time. Uh, they are intertwined with civilian assets in the civilian population. Nevertheless, uh, these were uh, communications devices used by them. Now, there were uh, two children uh, who were killed, uh, I think, on the first day, and another, a 16-year-old that was killed on the second day was actually claimed by Hezbollah as one of its members. Uh, they issued a statement uh, saying that this this uh, young man who had been uh, born in 2008 uh, was one of their members. Um, they, they released a martyrdom uh, announcement for him, identical to all other fighters that they released, all other members that they released. If we go back to the waning days of the, uh, uh, the intensive fighting in the Syrian civil war for Hezbollah, they were also losing a lot of 16 and 17-year-olds that were deploying to fight. So they are not above using child soldiers. As for the, the, the two children that were killed the, the day prior, it seems that perhaps uh, they were near Hezbollah members, um, perhaps their parents or something who, who had these, these beepers. But if we look at the videos uh, that we've seen of some of these, these pager explosions, including the one that you aired earlier, you can see that you have a Hezbollah member standing, uh, buying produce with people around him, and not so much as a tomato was damaged in the in that explosion. Definitely not the people around him. This is the definition of a pinpoint strike. And yeah, you're looking at some of that video right there on the left side of your screen. I did want to ask, because this seems like a pretty complex process. And I know, of course, you don't have inside information into any of this. But I did want to get your take on this overall, because this does seem kind of like the operation that took place over in Iran, where you did have a pinpoint strike that killed Ismail Haniyeh, the head there of Hamas at the time. My question for you, how exactly does Israeli intelligence or whoever might be involved here go about doing something like this? It must take months and months and maybe years of planning well in some cases in the cases of the uh the walkie-talkies that had exploded i remember uh yesterday watching lebanese news and 
uh, one of the individuals whose communication device exploded said he'd had it for three years. So this could have been uh, something that was a long process that the Israelis had been planning. Um, as for the, the pagers, uh, I again, I'm no uh, explosives expert. I don't know what the explosion that a phone uh, in and of itself, uh, what that would look like. Um, but I've heard uh, you know, parallel stories, if you will. One, that the Israelis were able to send a signal to these devices that would cause the lithium-ion battery to explode. I've also heard, uh, read other things that said that uh, lithium-ion battery explosions, while they can be painful, don't actually cause that much of a, an explosion, that somehow the Israelis would have had to um, <clears throat> interdict uh, the pager shipments that that Hezbollah had ordered to replace their prior communications devices and implant a small amount of explosives in them, and that's what we were seeing. Um, so, the, and lending credence to this, you have denials from companies in Hungary uh, and elsewhere uh, that uh, they were the suppliers uh, of of these devices. So it seems like perhaps the Israelis had interdicted. Uh, a weapons, or sorry, a, a, the, the communications devices shipment and implanted these uh, explosive devices, some small amounts of explosives, but just enough to cause the harm that we saw in them and that this lay dormant um, either for years in the case of the walkie-talkies or perhaps a couple of months uh, in the case of the of the pagers. Israel has not claimed responsibility for this attack, and if they are involved, of course, they're likely not to confirm it in any way. That is what we see happen uh, kind of consistently with these big operations. But Hezbollah has said they know Israel is behind it. So do we expect that Hezbollah will launch a large retaliation? Is it possible to really determine that at this point? Well, I think, look, they have Secretary General Hassan Nasrallah speaking later today, 10 a.m. our time, 5 p.m. their time. I think if they were going to launch uh, or transform the ongoing war of attrition that Hezbollah launched on October 8th uh, into a full conflict, they wouldn't necessarily announce it prior. Uh, being that they are the conventionally weaker party than Israel, they rely on the element of surprise. Um, I think that, you know, having Secretary General get on TV and announce uh, bloody retaliation, uh, massive retaliation in, this, in the form of a full conflict would, would waste that element of surprise. What we can expect is some form of retaliation. Look, this attack uh, de demonstrated, it wasn't just the, the kinetic impact, the deaths and the uh, the wounding, perhaps putting out of commission of thousands of Hezbollah fighters uh, f permanently from combat. Uh, beyond that, you have the uh, the demonstration of the penetration of his Israeli intelligence and Hezbollah's organizational apparatus and the humiliation for the organization, right? And that's a big deal for them. They they thrive uh, not necessarily out of ideological allegiance from their followers, but on the idea that they can uh, protect them, uh, that they uh, are a strong and capable resistance organization, organization that is able to deter or defeat Israel militarily. This punctures that image. So while they will have to respond, uh, they don't want a full war. Uh, they're not in a position for it now. Uh, and that response will have to balance uh, repairing the image, repairing, kind of reversing the humiliation that the Israelis inflicted upon them, uh, being sufficient to deter Israel, being painful enough to deter Israel, but also remaining below the threshold uh, that would grant Israel the legitimacy to launch a broader campaign in Lebanon. It's a, it's a juggling act that becomes uh, more untenable for Hezbollah with each one of these attacks that the Israelis launch against them. And I have to ask, if this does escalate, that's, of course, been a concern for months upon months that it somehow escalates into what's labeled an all out war. How would that differ from what we're seeing now? Because it already seems as though the two are at war. It just isn't classified that way. So would it actually change anything? Well, it is classified by that way by the belligerents themselves. Hezbollah has considered this a war for months now, and as have the Israelis. This is a low-level war of attrition. It's just one that the that both sides have decided to keep uh, contained within certain rules and certain parameters that have existed since October 8th. Uh, this the transition into a full war would see a large-scale bombardment uh, of Israel by, by Hezbollah's uh, massive rocket arsenal not just the north, and by the north I mean uh, 40 kilometers at least, that's the range of their short-range uh, projectiles, but also um, the deployment of their uh, precision-guided missiles, their longer-range missiles that could reach Tel Aviv, um, UAVs that can reach uh, 
as far south uh, as, as Eilat, other missiles, according to them, that can reach as far south as Eilat. Uh, we would see a massive Israeli ground invasion, combined arms maneuver in Lebanon, uh, meant to silence these rockets, meant to destroy them as quickly as possible, massive damage to Lebanon uh, and to the Israeli home front, perhaps for the first time uh, since the Israeli War of Independence that we're going to see uh, massive damage to the Israeli home front. It will be something that uh, will make Gaza look like nothing. And what we're seeing in Lebanon now, again, look like a minor skirmish uh, along the border, but it will be a massive war. It'll, it, the, the difference will be immediately recognizable. All right. David Dowd there with the Foundation for Defense of Democracies. Thank you so much, as always, for taking the time to join us and break down the latest out of that area. You are an expert on Lebanon and Hezbollah. So we really appreciate you joining us today. It's always my pleasure, Josh.